Hi everyone, Timothy Ferris here with a few words about the Voyager Golden Record. There are two of them, one attached to each of the uh, twin Voyager interstellar spacecraft, launched in 1977. And they're actually copper records, but they're coated in gold, so they won't develop a static electric charge that might interfere with some of the instruments on the probes. The uh, probes are now well out of the solar system. Voyager 1, the more distant one, is so far away that it takes its radio signals, traveling at the velocity of light, more than 20 hours to reach Earth as of uh, this recording, which I'm making in the year 2021. Both probes are still active, still sending back a certain amount of data, and NASA hopes that uh, before their plutonium power sources fade away, they will still be operating uh, through the 50th anniversary of the mission in the year 2027. I was the producer of the record involved in selecting the music, and myself and other principals in the project have been interviewed numerous times, books and articles. I thought I'd make this little video just to clarify how the Voyagers got to be where they are now, where they're going, and why we thought it was worthwhile to uh, put a gift, a greeting card, on these probes for the benefit of alien civilizations when we don't even know if any such thing exists in the Milky Way. So to talk about the dynamics of the Voyager mission, let me start with the solar system, and I'll use a CD here to illustrate the solar system. The sun would be a little dot in the center. Earth is following an orbit uh, near the inner part of the solar system. And the point I want to make here is that when you launch a probe like Voyager, you want to take advantage of the velocity that the Earth already has in its orbit. So you launch in the same direction that the Earth and all the other planets are rotating around the Sun. They're all in the same direction because they all condense down to the same cloud along with the Sun some four and a half billion years ago. So that velocity plus the rocket engine made it possible for each Voyager to get out to the planet Jupiter. And there something interesting happens. I'll use this trusty ball to be Jupiter. The Voyager comes up from behind Jupiter, so it spends a long time falling toward this heavy planet as they're both moving in the same orbital direction. And then it just snaps a whip around the giant planet. And in doing so, it steals a little bit of momentum from Jupiter, immeasurably small amount, but enough to get the Voyager probe going much faster. Fast enough, indeed, to exceed the escape velocity of the solar system. And that's why the two Voyagers uh, were destined to become interstellar space probes. Let me switch to, suitably enough, a vinyl phonograph record to represent uh, our galaxy. The proportions, oddly enough, are not that different. The spiral galaxies are pretty thin. In our galaxy, there's a bulge at the center. but Most of the stars out here are really in a thin disk. The solar system is up here about two-thirds of the way out from the center. Disk is more than 100,000 light years in diameter. And all these stars are rotating around the center of the galaxy. It takes about 250 million years to make an orbit. So the primary velocity of the Voyager probes is that of the Sun and the planets around the galaxy. They, they, are, they are exiting the solar system but they will now drift amid the other stars that are also orbiting the galaxy. So occasionally, from time to time, a star will drift close to the Voyager in the sense of coming, say, within a light year or so of it. But the experience for Voyager would be like being in a, a lifeboat. Um, occasionally, maybe you're, you see a ship far away pass a few miles, and its light brightens and then dims. The galaxy, like most of the universe, is mostly empty space. So the odds that you're going to run into a planet or a star are very low. For the Voyager probe to be found and for aliens to listen to the music someday, it would probably require that they detect the presence of the probe in their part of the galaxy, uh, snare it, bring it in and have a look. If they do that, they'll find that everything on the space probe has a clear scientific purpose cameras, magnetometers, things like that, except for the record. The record has no function except to 
tell you, the alien, something about uh, where it came from and who put it together, and about these odd things that we like, these musical passages that mean something to us. Now, we realize that uh, aliens wouldn't necessarily have music, they wouldn't necessarily have hearing, their hearing might not be in the same range as ours, the metabolic speed with which they live might be such that a human music would sound too fast or too slow. And for that purpose, we included some classical pieces that have interrelationships that are mathematically describable as symmetry, so that even if the music meant nothing, the aliens could find something useful just in the uh, mathematics of the music. We don't know whether alien civilizations exist or have existed or will exist in the future, and the big difference there is more about time than it is about space, which I'll explain in a moment. So we can argue from the case of our own planet that perhaps intelligence is commonplace in the galaxy, since we're just one planet, but we do have an intelligent species, which we define here as meaning a species that can construct an abstract symbolic language, such as the spoken languages heard on the record, uh, or mathematics, um, which is also evidence in many ways on the Voyager probes. But on the other hand, you can say, well, it took a long time for intelligence to appear here. The Earth is four and a half billion years old, and yet uh, human species only around 100,000 years old. So we just don't know. Some folks doubt that there are extraterrestrial civilizations. They like to cite something called the Fermi Paradox, which is not a paradox, but a casual remark by the great Italian physicist Enrico Fermi, who asked, well, where are they? You know, how come we don't see them here on Earth? Part of the answer to that, even if there are many civilizations in the galaxy right now, would be that it's awfully expensive to launch a big extraterrestrial expedition to just go look at a planet when you can much more cheaply communicate with other intelligences using radio or other sorts of signals that can travel through the space between the stars. Let me give you a quantitative example of what I mean. The Earth is four and a half billion years old. Humans capable of speech, uh, which you would have to have if you were to, you know, if you saw aliens landing on the Earth, you'd at least to form a folk tradition, you pass it down through generations. Such humans have only been around for around 100,000 years. So the chances of if aliens landed on Earth uh, in a starship, that they would have done so uh, while humans were here is 4.5 billion divided by 100,000. And that's only one chance in 45,000. So even if, uh, say, 100 alien expeditions had for some reason come to the Earth at random times in its history, and each had stayed for a year and done scientific uh, studies and so forth before departing, the odds that uh, any such visit would have occurred within the span of recorded human history, or even back with 100,000 years when some oral tradition might have developed, is still only a quarter of 1%. In other words, there is no Fermi paradox. The fact that we haven't seen a flying saucer land and aliens get out of it uh, tells us uh, really nothing about whether they're out there or whether they will be out there in the future. And it's future time that matters for the Voyager record in terms of whether they're ever going to find listeners. We made the record a metal LP, not just because LPs were the way people listened to music back in the 70s, but because information etched into the grooves of a metal record will last a long time. Scientists estimate that the outside of the Voyager record. It's in an aluminum case, but some cosmic rays can get through the case and erode the information in the grooves of the record. They estimate that that won't happen to a significant degree until about a billion years have elapsed. And the inner surface of the record, about two billion years. That's a lot of orbits around the galaxy. That's a long time. An alien civilization that picked up the record might not exist today. Its whole history may be ahead of us. Anyhow, we dedicated the record, and the dedication I wrote, uh, to the makers of music, all worlds, all times, and I'd like to salute them and say if you ever hear the record, I hope you'll find something interesting or maybe even uh, enjoyable there. It's a bottle that we've thrown in the cosmic ocean 
without hope of return. If you'll indulge me, perhaps I can read you a little something I wrote um, about that aspect of the mission uh, back in the 70s, uh, shortly after the uh, Voyager probes were launched. We don't know whether human music will mean anything to non-human intelligences, but any creature who comes across Voyager and recognizes the record as an artifact can realize that it was dispatched with no hope of return. That gesture may speak more clearly than music. The record says, however primitive we seem, however crude this spacecraft might be, we know enough to envision ourselves as citizens of the cosmos. It says, however small we were, something in us was large enough to want to reach out to discoverers unknown in times when we shall have perished or have changed beyond recognition. It says, whoever and whatever you are, we too once lived in this house of stars, and we thought of you. Hey, thanks for listening. See you next time. Suggestions for further reading. Murmurs of Earth, a book that those of us who put the record together wrote at the time to try to provide background for uh, future researchers. And the Osmo Records release of the Voyager record to which I wrote the liner notes. Thank you.